is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 569. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources. And joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, how it goes, sir? How was lunch? <laughs> lunch was mediocre, as you well know. Uh, but other, other, otherwise, things are good. Good, good, good. Luis, uh, we've got one of our uh, signature shows now. We love doing these. Uh, we're going to be doing a – what do we want to call them? Ancient set review, mm-hmm. rewind, something? I don't know. Whatever. Yeah, but, uh, flashback. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. whoa, whoa. Who was that TBS. speaking? You have not been introduced <laughs> yet, TBS. <laughs> you, know, you know the rules at this point. Yeah. All right. <laughs> let's get him in right now. We're welcoming back to the show our good friend, the Ben Sec, TBS. All the way from Barcelona, Spain. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. I had my birthday yesterday, so I'm kind of like still riding high off that. Oh, happy birthday. I hope you had a great day uh, with your family. And uh, we're super excited to to get you off of, right off of the birthday glow, right into one of our, <laughs> our lookbacks at an ancient set. Now, we're going to apply, though, modern design sensibilities and limited concepts and things like that to... One of the oldest, in fact, two of the oldest sets that we have in Magic. Uh, we did the Alpha set review. Now we're going to do Legends and the Dark today. So we are talking about some old school stuff. For those of you that are old school players, it'll be a walk down memory lane. And for those of you that are going the what and the what, uh, you're going to learn a lot about what Magic used to be like when it first came out and how much it's changed since then. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go through both of those sets. We're even going to do a crack a pack for Legends. Before we do, got to mention our sponsor, ChannelFireball.com. That's a place to go for all things Magic related. Anything you need on uh, the old internet, you're going to probably find it over at CFB. They're going to do everything they can to get it for you. Uh, I will say that there is a CFB pro showdown coming up as well. It's on Saturday, November 7th. So if you're listening to this show right when it came out, you can still have a chance to check it out. It's free to enter for all CFB pro members. And there's $1,000 in store credit on prizes on the line. Plus the winner will face the undefeated end boss who is, hmm, who could that be this time around? Hmm. <laughs> that, that would be me once again. Uh-huh. And you have so far defended CFB store credit <clears throat> nobly in your prior efforts. You're going to do it again? Oh, that's the plan. Uh, I'm, I'm three and zero so far in these end boss battles, so we'll see if fourth time's the charm. Has any has any end boss lost yet? Yes, Huey, Huey unfortunately Huey ha- has ah, has dropped the ball. Charitable <laughs> Huey, not playing <laughs> team ball for <laughs> Team CFB. So yeah, if you're a, a CFB pro member, you can do that now. In order to get CFB pro, you go over to channelfireball.com and you can sign up. Um, if you do sign up for it, you will get access to premium content that you won't get otherwise. Uh, and things like this. You get to play in the CFP Pro Showdown. There's a bunch of other perks as well. If you sign up, uh, make sure you use the affiliate code LR. It lets them know that we sent you over there to do so. Also, the show is brought to you by you via the Patreon, patreon.com slash limited resources. Uh, I'll keep it short. You can check out all the perks and things that you can get over there. And we want to thank each and every person who took the time to check it out and even support the show. It means the world to us. Okay. So, there's that. We're going to skip the Patreon question of the week this week because I want to get right into things with, with TBS, our special guest and our not so special guest, Luis Scott Vargas on legends. So let's get into it. Luis, give us the, let, let's say that, um, you started playing magic two years ago and maybe you've heard somebody say the words legends in a set, but you've never bothered to look it up and don't really know what's going on. What are the, what are the high, what's a high level view on what <clears throat> legends is? So Legends was the third set to, or fourth set to come out. Um, it was it released in uh, 1994. So this is about a year after Magic uh, came out. And mm-hmm. but like all the <clears throat> excuse me, all the previous sets, or Legends, Arabian Nights, Antiquities, The Dark were all in development, I believe, uh, well before Alpha even came out. Since that's just like the timeline you needed on, on these sets uh, and. Mm-hmm. Back then, things were a little bit looser just in terms of, you know, when things got printed and, you know, translation errors and uh, designers, you know, were not all very experienced because well, Magic had just started being made. This, they're still uh, kind of forging new territory. It's still a lot of trailblazing. And the, the, the most notable thing about Legends, uh, it's a pretty big set, 310 cards. And the most notable thing is that it introduced the concept of gold cards. Uh, it was the first time that we saw multicolor cards. And that is one of the, the, the highlights of the set. <clears throat> and one of the coolest things about the set 
I mean, me and TBS, I think, both have memories of, of what it was like back then. It's really hard to describe how cool these cards were. You, you had cards like Casimir the Lone Wolf is four blue-white for a 5-3. That's it. <laughs> There's no other abilities. And that was not the weakest of the legends. But you know what? These were legends. They were literally legendary in the sense that uh, originally all legends were restricted. You could only have one in your deck. And because only one existed in the world, of course. And we looked at these cards and we thought, wow, these cards must be bonkers. They got to be so good. When honestly, like you look at Savitri Skarzam, blue, black, five for a six, four. It's just <laughs> an expensive crawl room that's two colors <laughs> instead of one. But it wasn't that we thought that a two color card was was weaker than a one color card, even though we now know it is. We thought it was better. Mm-hmm. We're, we're willing to pay the cost to have a gold card because it's just mind blowing. It, it, and again, it, it probably sounds kind of dumb now, but I mean, TBS backed me up here. Like, what weren't these things just awesome? Oh, I mean, one of the things I love about Legends is it feels like it's a world and it has a lot of like rich history. And part of that is the fact that there are legends, and part of the fact that is that like the multicolored cards felt like they were so revolutionary at the time and. It was worth kind of like bending your decks where a lot of them were like, you know, one or two colors and some and these legend cards made you want to play three or four colors sometimes. Um, and as bad as some of the cards that Luis has kind of put it out for legends, there's some really good legends. I mean, pow- powerful, powerful cards that if they release them now, they would be still really good. So it, it, it was what that was one of the things about legends. And it's one of the things about early magic is that the, the power level of the cards range from hideous to like you couldn't possibly print it now; it'd break it in half. Standard, like it, you know, even considering all the things that happened in standard, if you put if you put some of these cards into standard, there was no chance that they would actually survive. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Legends might be the set that typifies this the most, right? It has this absurd range of garbage, unplayable, like actually, literally makes your deck worse. Up to what were they thinking level of broken? Yeah, you you have a set that is. Full of you know six seven mana six fours and and instants that only affect your walls, and then it also has <laughs> mana drain the abyss tabernacle at Pendrel Vale moat like that. This was this kind of a, it was typical of Magic design back then, where the sets would have way more zeros than than today, but also way more tens. Well, I, I guess that, that would have been true for like twenty four years, but <laughs> over this over this last year, it, it feels like they're they're back to slipping. Moats and mana drains into packs for no reason, like uh, <laughs> you know, omnaths or whatever. But, There's yeah, less like, zeros though. There's less zeros. There are now. less zeros. I, I mean, one of the famous quotes about legends, uh, when you look at it from a limited perspective, well, first of all, this might be the worst set we've ever seen for a, from a limited perspective. Like, I actually think it might be worse than antiquities. It's pretty close. Uh, red has at common one creature that can attack for damage. What? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's got it's got a uh, blazing effigy, which is a zero three. Three different kobolds, which are uh, zero ones, and Raging Bull is the only common red creature that can attack the opponent because it is two and a red for a two two with no text. Because there's also a, a wall sub theme in Legends, and there's just like three or four different walls at common. <laughs> that is absolutely um, incredible. To, to to be fair, uh, Limited really wasn't that much of a thing back then. This no. set is never intended to be so. Um, it, it it actually was the brainchild of only two designers. And then they actually had the development team um, kind of like like offsite essentially like give them some feedback and they kind of like tweak some stuff. So as Louis was saying, th- this isn't like sub- subject to the the rigors of what modern playtesting was. So it was just a, a bunch of ideas and they threw it on the wall. They did some tuning, they did some kind of color shifting and things like that, and that's it. That's that's they put out the set. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, one of the things that that happened was. There, some of the designers like kind of they design cards that or, or effects that weren't really in the colors of those cards. So the solution was to just make the cards more expensive to make them worse. Yeah, but it didn't really fix the color bleed. At all. It's interesting because that is one thing that stands out as you look at the cards. Right, was how not set the color pie was at this time. Um, they they seem to be willing to just fudge those kind of all over the place. I think because this was one of the first sets that wasn't done in house, they the the color pie wasn't internalized as well by these designers. Right. And as as Luis said, said 
the, they, the way they solved it was just casting cost and not by like doing too much kind of changing or where the abilities are. So uh, I would say it's one of the worst sets when it comes to adherence to the Kalpai. I mean, yeah. there's three different green cards that deal damage. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> sure. the Stor- Stormseeker, which is three in a green it's an instant. This card was awesome. It dealt yeah. one to your opponent for every card in their hand. Extremely not green. Uh, <laughs> there's <laughs> Typhoon, which is two in a green sorcery. It deals one damage to your opponent for every island they control. Punishing Blue is a little more green, but still not particularly green. Then there's Winter's Blast, which uh, taps X creatures and then deals two damage to each of them with flying. That That <laughs> at least... Like kind of passes it, but Stormseeker, like, come on. Like, they, they're not even close. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a blue direct damage card in the set, too, so... It, Psychic Purge. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, and so, Legends, it's funny, because so many of the, the cards from Legends, particularly the Legends themselves, but also cards like Alcor's Tomb, for example, are come from just D&D campaigns of the designers. You know, mm. they're D&D characters and campaigns that have kind of influenced the Legends set, because it's like, Hey, how do we make a bunch of legendary, you know, adventurers? And it's like, well, I I, I used to have, you know, this this barbarian named Casimir the Lone Wolf. Let's make him. You know, and, and that's that kind of stuff is awesome. I, I I really enjoy the the kind of feel of it. But it does feel, it's just like a lot of the the older sets. There's no real unifying thing. Like they don't really explain who these people are in relation to each other. There's not really an overarching story. And there's a lot of individual card designs. It's just all over the place. Like that's just that's just something that happened back then. Yeah, TBS. Yeah, if they, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, go go ahead. I was going to say if if we put ourselves in in you said it was primarily from two designers. If we put ourselves in their seats at the time when they were actually designing this set, Magic was not out yet or somewhere in that. Like they didn't no, understand yet that out. they had like a massive, massive hit on their hands. Right, like. I wonder well, if these designers actually, understood that oh. they were designing something that would sort of stand in history, right? Like <laughs> this no was way. a small <laughs> game and small indie game, right? So, so, so I, I kind of in preparation for for this podcast, like I read a little bit of the the history of it, and when they started, they had no idea. I think by the time um, they knew they were going to print the, the the cards themselves. They actually knew that they needed to get a set out because Magic had been such a hit mm. that they they needed to hurry and have more content because um, within the first year there were like three sets. Um, which, when you when you and when you think about like that in kind of a old game context, that was a lot of expansions within a very very short amount of time. Right. Um, and, and so, so I think they had an idea that it was going to be good. The set itself actually won a Gen Con award for like best game expansion of the year. So, like you know, very soon they actually got a, a lot of um, you know plaudits for for actually you know doing a reasonable job. And to be honest, I think this actually expanded the mythos of Magic very well. Like you can't help but be excited looking at these cards. To be honest. This is actually the set full of my favorite, most favorite art. I mm. think the art of this set is like, I mean, there's so many different styles. It's very kind of classic D and D fantasy in some ways, but it also has so many different like I don't know themes and 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 kind of feelings. I, I don't know. I, I I love this set for art, and I look at my own legends collection, like cards I have from <coughs> legends, and I just look at them so fondly, just because. I don't know. There's, there's something about these cards. There's something about how they've they presented that really, really evocative. Well, it's really funny because in like you, like we mentioned earlier, this set wouldn't fly now. And in fact, even for then, there's like walls are a major sub theme. There's just like a ton of walls in the set and cards that only affect walls. Like like let's let's check out a uh, glyph of destruction. This is like one of my favorite cards in the set. It's so funny. So uh, glyph of destruction is one red man. It's an instant. Target wall you control gains plus 10 plus 0 while blocking. Any damage dealt to target wall is reduced to 0. Target wall is destroyed at the end of turn. So it gives your wall plus 10 plus 0 and makes it immune to damage, but then it kills at end of turn. And <laughs> I just remember trying to figure out ways, like, how could I use this in a way that's, like, really sweet? You know? Like, there's it's, it's just wild. And the, the glyphs were a cycle, by the way. There was... A, uh, one for every color, and they were all instants that you cast on your own walls or while they were blocking, uh, or or creatures blocked by your walls, stuff like that. So yeah, that kind of stuff's wacky, but 
Legends just, it was very well received at the time. Like TBS said, it won an award. I remember as a Magic player, kind of at the time, it sold out quickly. I I literally started playing Magic and got to the point where I wanted to buy a pack of Legends the same week that they ran out of Legends at my local store and they never got it again. I'm mm. still waiting for them to restock Legends. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you saved up for I mean, it. Yeah, it was twelve dollars. I mean, the, and the retail of the, of the packs were like four bucks or whatever. Yeah, you know, three bucks. And soon all the prices went up because everyone wanted it. And and even back then we weren't as good at evaluating cards or sets or anything like that. It was just a very different place. Yet st- people still knew that you know Homelands and Fallen Empire sucked. Legends did not. Legends was awesome. Right. Yeah. It, this was actually my first expansion pack that I ever bought. Was a Legends one. I got like what one pack out of the last box in Australia or something like that. And, yeah. And, and, TBS yeah. just one one upping me once again. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I live for, really. Um, <laughs> but 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 it, it it it's it's why I think the set also has a lot of kind of resonance with me. I think I built so many decks out of that pack. Um, I did get that glyph and a um, glyph of destruction, and eventually I traded for a sword of the ages, which basically allows you to kind of like throw a bunch of creatures at your opponent, um, depending on the on their on their power. Yeah, and- so yeah, so sword of the ages is a six mana artifact, enters the battlefield tapped. And you can tap it and sack it and sack any number of creatures to deal damage equal to their power. And this card was restricted. <laughs> this card was deemed to be too powerful to have more than one. <laughs> I was so proud to have this card. You just <laughs> That's Oh, sweet. it was an incredible card. I remember wanting one really badly. And it, it was not good. <laughs> this is funny. The Going back to the walls thing, I, I just did a search. And there are 18 cards in the set that have the word wall on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and that's not even the worst part the, you, you know what the worst cycle or sub theme in in legends was it was the bands with others so oh yeah banding is already bad banding we talked about this in the alpha set review it's the it's the mechanic where you kind of get to attack or block as a big group and the person who has the banding creature distributes damage and all that legends took an already very clunky confusing mechanic and made it even somehow more awkward they have a cycle of lands and uh, the Adventurer's Guildhouse cycle. So this is a land, and it says all your green legends gain bands with other legends. So what does this mean? It means that your green legends can band with other legendary creatures. You know, you know what else? This land doesn't have for mana. It, it is a land. It just sits there. It doesn't tap for mana. It makes it so your green legendary creatures can band with other legendary creatures. And guess what? There's five of these. There's one for each color. Incredible. <laughs> it's, but don't worry, don't worry. There's counterplay. There's also a cycle of legendary lands, and this one you'll probably have heard of. This is a cycle that has Caracas and Pendlehaven, that sort of thing. And the blue one's called Talaria, and Talaria taps for blue. So, you know, it's a land that taps for mana. And it says, tap during upkeep, remove the banding or bands with other ability from target creature until end of turn. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm just glad that the blue one of a cycle happens to be the worst one. That, that's got to be like oh, the this, first. This cycle was very strong. I mean, Caracas is one of the best cards in the set. Still sees tons of legacy play. That's the land that taps for white or to return a legendary creature to its owner hand. Uh, Pendlehaven taps for green or gives a 1-1 creature plus 1 plus 2. And uh, TBS, what about Hammerheim and Urborg? <laughs> I mean, Hammerheim is bad, but it's not as bad as Talaria. It's uh, tap for a red. Uh, tap to remove all land walking ability from target creature until end of turn. Not the most useful, but at least it wasn't referring to bands with other. Um, and Urborg, and Urborg basically removes. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm just getting this card is actually hard to read. It loses um, first, remove strike first strike or swamp walk. Or swamp walk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you, so- I mean, you're. You're playing, you're playing Swamps, so removing Swamp Wolf's got to be, you know, some, something. It doesn't cost you oh. anything. You play one of them in your deck. And, and well, by the way, these are interesting. Like, this is Urborg, not the Urborg that people think of that sees, like, modern yeah. play or whatever. This is the OG Urborg. And, yeah, that's Teleria. Like, Telerian, you know, Academy and, and Ruins. Yeah, this, this is OG Teleria. Unfortunately, it's kind of a junker, but still. I mean, the lore from Legends set the groundwork for so many different things. Ever heard of uh, Commander? You, you know what it was called before? It was called Elder Dragon Highlander, EDH. The Elder Dragons are a legend. This is Nicol Bolas, the original Nicol Bolas. Palladium Moors, uh, 
And the other ones, are, well, you got Chromium, Arcades Sabbath, and uh, Vivictus. Vivictus Asmati, right, right, right. That's the last one. And the, the, these cards were all awesome, too. They were eight mana, three, it was like two mana of three different colors plus two colorless mana, and they cost you one of each color mana during your upkeep. But they are all these seven, seven flyers with massive abilities. And, like, this is why you make a set called Legends. Yes. Like, they didn't, they didn't miss on the stuff that mattered. Yeah, there's a lot of things that kind of suck about the set. Like, some of the cards are way too bad, some of the cards are way too good, and a lot of them are nonsensical. But you know what? You, you you got the legends right. You, you made a cycle of elder dragons. I mean, in, in D&D, the dragons are kind of the pinnacle, right? So having, in the name, having a cycle of these elder dragon legends was so perfect. Everyone wanted them. They were, they were so cool. Having all these other cool legends, ha- having enough cool imaginative cards, old card files have this unique charm where, yeah, there were some cycles. There was a glyph for each color, and, you know, there's there's other cycles in the in the set. But in general, you just never knew what, you, you, what to expect. You'd look at a color and you'd just be like, whoa, look at this card. This card's so cool. And that that's something that you lack a little now, but it also makes more sense to have the sets be more tightly designed as well. Yeah, yeah I mean, th- th- mm-hmm. th- there's a bit of looseness when it comes to the design. You can really tell by, like, how many cards are very, very illegible by the number of uh, <laughs> words they have Lines on the of card. Text. Yes. I mean... Don't ever try and figure out how Chains of Mephistopheles works because right. you'll probably fall asleep trying to read the card. It's, I mean, actually, once you get someone to explain it in kind of layman's terms, it, it makes sense. But it's v- like by reading it, it's really, really hard, hard to figure it out. Um, but in, in general, a lot of these cards try to push the boundaries of what magic does. And they it, they do it in a, a kind of a flavorful way and an interesting way. I mean, and I think even cards like... Um, the Enchant Worlds. I actually really, really enjoy the Enchant Worlds from Legends. I mean, they're not all good, but they are quite flavorful. And the ones that are good are actually kind of like interesting puzzles to figure out. Um, you've got Abyss, which basically makes you um, destroy a non-artifact creature um, like every upkeep. Each player has to like destroy mm-hmm. a, a non-artifact creature every upkeep. If, if there isn't any cr- creatures, uh, it's buried. Uh, like building a deck of artifact creatures to com- like to, to pair with this, or to build a like a bunch of creatures with a shroud that that work with this. Like I used to have a, an abyss um, uh, deadly insect deadly insect deck that, yep. that was like <laughs> like it was just a fun deck. To well, well, look well, before we go any further, I do want to define enchant world because I think most people will not have heard of what that is. That the idea behind enchant worlds was whoever cast it was transporting both people in the duel to the new world with new rules. So enchant worlds all affected both players and the way they worked. So the abyss is an enchant world or concordant crossroads. It's one green mana for an enchant world that all creatures have haste. And the way enchant worlds worked is whenever a new one came in, it blew up old ones. So there was a time period where having concordant crossroads in your beatdown deck was good, especially because it could blow up opposing copies of abyss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's a, Kind of a mechanic that's a little fiddly, like as in you have to kind of like look to see if your enchantment happens to be enchant world and things like that. But like it, from a flavor perspective, it was really really cool that you have this kind of like enchantment that's affecting all the players and how how they interact. And and on top of it all, I think a lot of the designs are pretty cool. Yeah, you know one one thing I wanted to hit on uh, with you guys to, to to sort of hammer the point home that you guys just uh, were talking about, which was the effect that this had on on players. Because I, I wasn't playing when Legends came out, but I did start shortly after. So these cards were very much around. And I, I you know, I, I still saw them, um, you know, floating around. And it's really interesting because the, even though a lot of these dragon things, you know, are, are the Elder Dragons or these type of cards are a little bit, sketchy now when you look at like power level or when you put them on the dynamic that players would use now. And the one I want to use as the example is OG Nicol Bolas, who, by the way, is reading a book. Like he's in his library, just having a little read and a sit down. This is how they viewed the elder dragons. Then he's not flying over, you know, blasting magical energy on like innocent town folk. He's sitting back and reading but it cost eight mana. It's two blue, blue, black, black, red, red. And I'm going to read the original text because it's a little more evocative. But it says, pay blue, red, black during your upkeep or nickel bullets is buried. 
which means you sacrifice it now. It's flying 7-7, <laughs> seven, seven, and it says, an opponent damaged by Nicol Bolas must discard entire hand. Ignore this effect if opponent has no cards left in hand. <laughs> <laughs> but this made you imagine hitting your opponent and them discarding seven cards. Never actually happened this way. But, you know, and going like, no, you hit me with Nicol Bolas. Oh, my God. And you going, I did it. I, I made it happen. When you look at the the big stuff, right? The things that were like, I'm trying to set my sights high to do big things in this, in this game of magic. Before Legends came out, your options were very limited. For example, from Antiquities, Arabian Nights, and Unlimited, if, <clears throat> if you take those sets, the number of creatures that cost more than six mana. So this again is remember a, a, a large part of the magic audience, especially at this time were Timmy's, right? They like to do big things, right? People all, always have stories about trading power nine cards for craw worm because craw worms big and they wanted to do big things and making mana isn't fun. Making craw worms is well, your options. There were four cards that were creatures that cost more than six. There was Lord of the Pit, which was awesome and did exactly what I'm talking about here. But the others didn't. Colossus of Sardia, Island Fist, Jasconius to a point, and then Mishra's War Machine were the others. But you compare that to what we see when we, when we get to Legends. There are 23 cards in the set that cost more than six. And the majority of them are gold. And they're not just two color gold. Sometimes they're three color gold, like the Elder Dragons as well. And these have way more rules text on them than you would expect. They, and they're interesting. And like you said, TBS, and this is a point I really wanted to hammer home is that they made you an aspirational player. They made you go, I want to get that thing on the battlefield and then do the thing that it says on the card because then I feel like that, like if I got to make my opponent discard their hand with Nicol Bolas, that wasn't necessarily about winning the game. It was about, you know, achievement unlocked. And that these cards kind of all have that going on. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like, I have so many, I, just looking through the set right now, it's like there's so many decks that I've built because I want to play a single legend. Like Rasputin Dreamweaver. I mean, I love this card. This card, this card actually was well, actually pretty good. So it's uh, four, it's four blue white. And it's a 4-1. But then when it comes into play, it comes into play with seven counters, I believe. I just don't remember exactly. And you can remove counters from it to either uh, to get man colorless mana, or I think if it takes damage, it also prevents that damage. I, I, I have to read this card properly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, can pr you can remove a counter to prevent one damage to Rasputin or to add one to your mana pool. And then... Right. Um, if he starts your turn untapped, you get another counter. <laughs> yes. So, so what? It's super flavorful. Like this guy's kind of healing every round, so that's that's cool. Uh, but actually, what you try try to do is like cast big brain geysers with this guy. Well, it, yeah, he's you, kind of like a a, a a wizard cleric, right? He can either yeah. heal or cast big spells with his mana. Right, and that gives yeah, you I mean, that blue white feel, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. it, you know, this is a, a, a bunch of like cool cards. Um, well, what's another one that, that well, I really before, before I, you go to the next one, a TBS, I yeah. also want to highlight about Rasputin Dreamweaver is something that you touched on earlier, which is the art, right? I mean, by modern standards, this looks like it was drawn on a napkin, right? Like it's just not up to, to, you can almost just see the, you know, the box of colored pencils get opened up before the piece of paper was touched by Andy Rusu, who did the artwork for this. But I'm saying that as a compliment because this, it, each of these cards has a very different feel to them artwork wise. Like this one feels a little rougher, but he kind of looks kind of, you know, like a kind of like a drifter. But, you know, artwork wise, this is not even close to on par with what we have available now, but you get this awesome difference of styles that you don't see now. Things are pretty homogenous now for the most part. Yeah, I mean, if you looked at Solkanar the Swamp King, mm -hmm. uh, Ramirez de Petro, and like, uh, you know, Lady Orca, you'd get three very different art pieces in the same set, all of which look kind of badass. You'd have the, you know, Phil Foglio Ramirez de Petro art, which has a goofy looking pirate lord versus 
uh, Richard Kane Ferguson drawing Solkinar, who just looks like a supreme badass. I love Solkinar. That was also one of my favorite cards back then. Yep, that was a big hit. Yeah. Yeah, no, so, I, I love Dakon as well. Dakon Blackblade is also one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. That, 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 that Richard Kane Ferguson art is it's so good. It's, as you know, Solkinar is great. Dakon's great. Like, all the art from Richard Kane Ferguson is, uh, is really awesome. Yeah, he was one, a one of the people who, who who kind of epitomizes legends, and his art actually holds up, I think, pretty well. It does, uh, yeah. Just because of the level of detail he puts in. Uh, so and another thing that happened in Legends that was really funny were kobolds. Yes. So, th- again, this is this is super D&D feel. Kobolds are like the classic level one half mob in D&D. These are, so what kobolds are in this set is – uh, there's Crookshank Kobolds, Crimson Kobolds, and Kobolds of Care Keep. And they're all zero mana, zero ones. And their text is, this card is a red spell when cast, and Kobolds are a red creature. <laughs> <laughs> so really some grammatical issues there too. But uh, the, And then to, to like to, to make the Kobold deck, you had Kobold Drill Sergeant that gives all your Kobolds plus zero, plus one, and trample. So now you've got a bunch of O2 trampling Kobolds. <laughs> <laughs> you also have Co- Kobold Overlord, which... Gives all your kobolds first strike. So now all your kobolds have first strike. They're all zero two trampling first strikers. <laughs> uh, and, the, and then you had uh, there's there's kobold uh, a taskmaster. Oh, wait, there, the taskmaster I don't think was in the set. Okay, no. Yeah. You have so, the Roga. No, it is oh, no, in the ta- set. No, there, it's there, in there, there it is. Kobold, yeah. kobold taskmaster. So all the the, the the Kobold Lords are two mana one twos, and this one gives all your Kobolds plus one plus zero. So now you've got a bunch of one two trampling first strikers, <laughs> but then you have Roga of Care Keep, and this was the legend that kind of tied it all together. Uh, he is two black black red red for a five five. All your Kobolds of Care Keep. So not even all your Kobolds, <laughs> only the Kobolds of Care Keep. One third of the Kobolds available <laughs> get plus two plus two. <laughs> During your upkeep. Pay red, 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 or Roga, and all kobolds of care keep become tapped and come under your opponent's control. If you, if, <laughs> if you don't pay Co- Roga, him, he takes his army and he leaves. <laughs> to your opponent! Yeah. <laughs> and you have to pay a cost that isn't built into the cost of Roga either. <laughs> it's yes. It's brutal. There, there, like, I, like I said, there, there, is, there is some issues here. Um, that is and, uh, unbelievable. Yeah. I've never seen but, this but, card. Oh, and it, the thing is, awesome. like, I mean, yeah, I mean, look, even as as bad as all these cards are, like, th- they were breaking some new ground. One is like zero costing, like creatures that had color. That was actually really new, um, and you know, ha- having the legend tied together kind of like made this kind of like deck in a box, even though it wasn't a very good deck. And it, it's it's so resonant that I mean, the most recent set, Commander Legends, has a kobold in it, and it, I think it's super cool. Uh, I, I, yeah. I saw you. You said on on Twitter, Luis. They, you know, you may not ever play this card, but it is cool. Yeah, yeah. that's the new Cobalt Legend. I don't, I don't even remember the name anymore, but it's zero mana, zero one, like trample first strike menace. That is <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, you know, and there's yeah. also, I mean, and the funny part is, is that these these cards, even ones as ridiculous as these, right? Where, and again, by the way, I'll go back to the point. That, w- that we talked about before, which is that it makes you want to do a thing, right? Like you're not incentivized to play any of these kobolds for, because they're good cards, but how sweet would it be if you could take these bad cards and put them together in some combination to actually win a game, right? That is, that is a, a goal worth pursuing, you know, when, when you're looking at magic during this time. Also these cards, like, isn't there a legacy deck that uses them or something? Like, I know it's not like a tier there, one deck, there, but they're around. There have, there have been a variety of decks that utilize zero mana creatures with like glimpse of nature, that sort of thing. Exactly. Uh, you know, well, one thing I want to remind you of though, is when you say like, Oh yeah, the dream is you put these bad cards together and make a, and make a good deck that people didn't even know they were bad. People honestly looked at kobolds and yeah. did not think they were bad because they were free. Yes. They cost zero. Yes. The, the ornithopter yeah. conundrum. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I just want to point out also Legends had the first Planeswalker. <laughs> it did. It did. <laughs> that is true, technically. Uh, that is but, technically but, true. <laughs> but t- t- TBS uh, is referring to Righteous Avengers. It's four to white for a 3 1, has Planeswalk. Can't be blocked if the defending player controls a Planes. And you know what is funny? <laughs> that Here's another putrid cycle. The cycles in Legends are bad. 
I actually think the cycles generally generally were not good. Uh, Great Wall is two and a white. It's an enchantment. Creatures with Planeswalk may be blocked as if they do not have this ability. It affects <laughs> at the time of printing. It affected exactly one creature. In unbel- and also, by the way, like time out, time out, time out. <laughs> so this set has a full on wall sub theme, and the card called Great Wall in the set is not a wall. <laughs> It's yeah, top down. You know that, that, that's pretty. That's pretty incredible. Like what the hell? <laughs> yeah, wow. that, that 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 that's a good flavor fail there. I mean, uh, that and, is funny. You know, I mean, an, an, another theme from this set. Another one of the new abilities was Rampage. So Wolverine mm. Pack is two green green for a two four Rampage two. Well, what is Rampage? If this creature is blocked, for every creature beyond the first, it gets plus. X plus X or X is its rampage number. So if you blocked the Wolverine pack with one creature, it's two, four. If you block with two creatures, it's a four, six. If you block with three creatures, it's a six, eight. And this ability, unsurprisingly, was really, really not good. That said, it was still aspirational. There's a card called Rathy Berserker. It's two red, red, red for a two, four. It had rampage three. So he he, he just went nuts. The, the dream was to put lure on him, attack. Your opponent had to block with like five creatures. He gets plus 12, plus 12, then you berserk him. I, you know, this takes me back. I tried to do all of these things. None of them ever worked, and I still had a really good time playing. Me with too. All these cards. Do you know what mine was? It was Craw Giant. Oh, I love oh, yeah. Craw Giant. Yeah, this was three green, 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 green for a six-four trample rampage two. So if you, I had, I, I'm kind of sad that you said that, Luis, because I literally had that. I had a lure Craw Giant <laughs> deck, and it's exactly as you described. It never worked. And I didn't care. It was the dream. It was the, the you know, the pie in the sky. Like, But I could combo off at some point and get my opponent to block with eight creatures on my craw giant and kill them. Yeah. It was just, it was just so cool. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So we've been talking about a lot of, like, crappy cards. But one of the things that people really love about Legends is it still represents some of the most powerful cards in, in, in the game. I mean, this, this card's like the Abyss we've talked about. Mana drain uh, for those. Well, we should mana we drains. should mention TBS by the way the the effect that Legends has uh, on like like we we use the term the abyss as slang now yes. for a game situation where opponent must chump block every turn or die right that's that's shorthand is I've got them in the abyss and that's because they're losing a creature every turn no matter what and that's what the abyss does these little ripples in our culture right in our magic culture i mean this card came out in 1994 and you'll still hear people saying probably not even knowing what it's referencing i've got them in the abyss or i'm abyssing them you know and and yep. you know what they mean anyway carry on no no there, there, there's so many of these cards that basically you know like refer to sorry so many of these themes that refer to specific legends cards um but yeah i mean i i think a lot of people know legends now by how it has its effect on like uh vintage or legacy yeah and it's really defined by some of these like awesomely powerful cards that you know really do break the game in half like mana drain is absurd and you know it the fact that uh it i don't know it, it, it it's so good that it's i think it's banned in uh legacy it's just yeah. too good. For is legacy. Mana Drain the best counter spell ever printed? Uh, I actually think Force of Will is better. Okay. Yeah. It, so it's, it's a kind best? of tricky question. So mm-hmm. Mana Drain is a more powerful card than Force of Will, but in the for, the only formats where Mana Drain and Force of Will are legal, Force of Will is better. Mm-hmm. Because those formats, Mana Drain is only legal in, in Vintage and it's just a really fast format. Uh, we've been talking about Mana Drain a bit. This is a blue blue counter target spell. And so already counterspell, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Which is already deemed to be too good for standard and modern. And then at the beginning of your next main fade, it's at X colorless mana, where X is the spell's casting cost. It, mana drain is just stupid. It's you, broken. Your, your, it is your broken. opponent would mana drain your three drop and then cast a six drop on their turn three. Yeah. What was the idea that, that since mana burn existed at the time? Yeah, that balanced it. Well, that, the that idea was supposed was to that, balance it somehow or? Uh, uh, at the idea, I don't think that. That wasn't how things were thought of back then. It okay. wasn't balanced. The idea wasn't to balance because this was still uh, – when Legends was made, I mean I don't know the exact, exact timeline. But I still have to assume 
that they were kind of under the impression that the average person would have access to a couple hundred cards. It mm. doesn't really matter if Mana Drain and Counterspell both exist in the world where most people are opening the equivalent of 10 packs and building a sealed deck. Right, right. right. Yeah, because it is interesting. Again, you know, I, I mentioned this at the at the onset, but you have to really put yourself in the seat of the people who designed these cards and what they were thinking. And, you know, everybody's been to like a game store and seen the shelf of random card games that you've never heard of and will never play. They're just these little indie brand, you know, like they're cool. Maybe one of them will catch on and people will play it or whatever, but they don't, you know, become 20 million player franchises that last for 30 years or whatever. They're just a, a small studio came out with a cool little game and they, they try to get them on the shelves of the store. And, you know, magic transitioned out of that very, very quickly. But if you're working on magic before it did that, you're probably assuming it's roughly on par with those, right? It's, it's yeah. a, it's a little thing. So if you were making a game like that and you're a game designer in 1993, 1994, you know, you're not sitting there going like, well, we can't print Mana Drain. You know, that's just too I, good. It's strictly I, better than Counterspell, right? Yeah. It, it, I don't even know that I would even necessarily classify these people as game designers. Like they were game designers and that's what they were doing. I don't even know that that was like – They were like mathematicians their, or their whatever. Profession, their, their profession. Yeah. It, it was a very different thing. It was yeah. – People who were designing games, not I. You know, I went to game design school, <laughs> though okay. yeah. that's more of a recent thing, anyway. Yeah, and, and most of these cards are pretty top down. Like, and what do we mean by top down design? Is that they have a concept, they they have a dragon, or they have this counter that you know drains mana. It right? literally and then, and then drains kind of, their mana. <laughs> right, and then it's like, okay, how does this work? And so you you'll see a lot of these cards like end up a little bit more clumsy. Because they're, they're, they're trying to go from a concept to a card, which is not always the most direct way of, like, designing cards. I mean, look, some of the best cards are, are top-down design. I think I, I think it's a really, really powerful, like, strategy to use as a game designer. But sometimes it ends up in some weird places. So so um, you were mentioning the busted cards here, TBS. You mentioned Mana Drain. What are the, the Abyss? What are some of – what are the other most, like co- like, the cards that would stand out – or have even stood the test of time all the way until today, where you, where you think to uh, of legends. Oh, so, so I have my favorite card in the set, and it's uh, Eureka, which mm. is kind of a card. It's it, it's it's busted. It's also kind of unplayable at the same time. Um, and so, what it does is it's 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 green green two. It's a sorcery. Uh, basically, starting with yourself. You get to play a permanent for free, just put it into play, <laughs> and then the other player gets to put a permanent. And basically, you just take turns playing permanents until everyone's decided that they don't want to play more permanents. So you can just, like, I, I, I remember, like, I actually still have the Eureka from my original, like, trade back then. So this, this is a card that's never left my collection. Oh, cool. Um, that it's, you know, you're just like, okay, what are the biggest creatures in the game? What's the biggest permanent in the game? And I would just like try and like make these ridiculous Eureka decks. Um, now, the reason why you, you can't make this card, this card is just kind of busted in half in the wrong in the wrong way. But at the time, there wasn't enough kind of good stuff to do with Eureka, and there was always the the threat that your opponent could actually have like a few things that are really bad for you too. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I love this card. I think this card's busted. I don't think it's like too good. I just think it's not really good or well balanced. I guess just completely bypassing the mana system doesn't sit well with you. (laughs) Yeah, It's the kind of card that can lead to awesome games. I think the average game where Eureka was cast in 1994 was probably amazing. Mm -hmm. I think that once people started to know what they were doing better, it wasn't the kind of card that led to particularly interesting games. I mean, hypergenesis got banned in modern for a reason. It's just kind of dumb if you just put your whole hand on the table and see who has more stuff. Well, the but reason was that, because me and you busted it at the community cup, but anyway. it's true. That is the that is the, <laughs> the that is, that is the that is what happened. I guess the the underlying yeah. reason is that it's busted. Yeah. We, we did have to. Be. <laughs> I mean, oh. Legends had some weird throwback stuff too. By the way, it still had anti cards. <laughs> oh, that hadn't left yet, huh? No, they have like Tempest of Freet, which is. One red, red, red for a 3-3, and it says, tap, pick a card at random from opponent's hand and place it in yours. Bury Tempest to free in opponent's graveyard. The change in ownership is permanent. What? <laughs> it <laughs> so, gave them your Tempest to free? You sacked yeah. Tempest to free to steal a card from their hand, put it in your hand. Tempest to free goes to their graveyard. But 
their opponent, the dis- disabilities play doesn't interrupt, which was faster than an instant back then, but the opponent may prevent the effect by paying 10 life or conceding game before the card is switched. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, and and by the way, if if you know you can see the the picture of Tempest to Freed, you know it, it, it's one triple red for a three three, but th- the original text uses up like every inch of that text box. I mean, they oh, are tiny not letters, messing yeah. around. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, and it, it, yeah. Sorry. Oh, I was gonna say playing for anti left fairly quickly. It turns out people just didn't want to lose their cards when playing random games against other it people. It just felt too bad, yeah. Uh, what are other... I, I want to uh, knock out a few of the more, like, really stand out, most powerful cards. One of them, um, the Tabernacle at Pendril Vale. I believe that's the most expensive card in Legends currently. It is, uh, I looked, so yeah. It, it's yes. a land that, doesn't again, doesn't tap for mana, and it says all creatures require an upkeep cost of one colorless, uh, or is they're, they're destroyed. So... It's funny that Tabernacle is really good right now. It's a legacy staple in some in some decks, and it's uh, it's seeing a lot of vintage play as well as a sideboard option against like the Bizarre Baghdad decks, another busted old land. But back then, Tabernacle wasn't good. Everyone just had a bunch of lands in play at all times, and like it, you know, there there weren't like yes, it would be good against like a a, a kind of like aggro deck that was curving out, but people really didn't do that yet. Yeah, your opponent had seven lands in play. They had to tap two of them to pay for their two five drop creatures. It was it was not an impressive card, though. It is very good now. Yeah, I mean, you could, you, and you can't tap it for mana. So back then, it was actually a pretty big drawback. Not you know playing lands that actually don't tap for mana. So that's that's something that doesn't matter as much now because it hoses so many decks. I mean, you know, Dredge can't really play against this card. That it's that kind of card now. Yeah, um, it, it, it is the most expensive card, by the way. Looking back, it it's about two thousand dollars for a Tabernacle at Pendrel Vale, and the next uh, most expensive is the Abyss, which comes in at around seven hundred. So it's actually like pretty significantly the most yeah. expensive. Another uh, powerful card. Sorry. No, uh, just just for your for your list uh, is moat. moat. Moat was like for, for the longest time was like one of the most powerful cards. It doesn't have as much cachet as it used to, but it actually was part of one of the m- most power like successful decks at the time called the deck. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, so the moat is a uh, white white two enchantment and non flying creatures uh, cannot attack. So, so basically, again, beautiful like, top down design here, right? Yeah, that's right. So, so only flies work, and so what the 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 deck would do, or the the deck called the deck, uh, would be get a moat down, basically protect yourself from all the weenie swarms, and you just have a, like a Sarah Angel just pecking your way at your, your opponent while you protect it with counter magic. It was, it was basically one of the the, the earliest uh, control decks out there. Yeah, the, there were some decks that just straight up couldn't beat moat. It was it was, it was a, a, an incredibly powerful card, and still, again, sees play here and there in Legacy. Though I think it finally left the Vintage Cube. That card is just way too bad. Uh, Nether Void was another pretty messed up card. A lot of the Enchant Worlds were messed up. This is three and a black for an Enchant World. Uh, whenever any player plays a spell, they have to pay three mana, or that spell is countered. So not <laughs> only black. is it brutal, be- <laughs> because it makes uh, spells like it just locks everyone out of the game, like. You know, the, the old classic was you went like land Lotus Nether Void, then they can never cast a spell for five turns. You couldn't either, but presumably your deck was built with like Misha's Factories or whatever. It also says pay three uh, or it becomes countered, which means someone would play a spell. You'd be like, yeah, you have to pay three, and then they wouldn't be able to pay three, and then it just gets countered. <laughs> <laughs> um, this doesn't fit into the most powerful section, but it does fit into the throwback. So um, if you remember Chaos Orb, so that Chaos Orb at the time was the only card that did, like, had dexterity. You had to throw the card literally onto the onto the battlefield. Um, so Legends has the other dexterity card um, in the set. So it's Falling Star. It's red and two. It's basically used exactly the same way as, um, as Chaos Orb. You've got to drop it from, I think, at least a foot above the battlefield. That's right. And, and it has it, to it turn landed. at least 360 degrees or it has no effect. <laughs> And so whatever it landed on, it did three damage. So it's basically a bolt um, attached to uh, a, to a card. I mean, this card isn't very good, but it was like I, I really like this card just because I like Chaos Orb, and you know, returning to that cycle was actually pretty cool. Yeah, you yeah, know, this, it is this funny. Hit some of the notes that, uh, that we previously saw with yeah. cards like Chaos. Orb. You can see that the carrying over as they start to dwindle away the ante and the 
uh, the dexterity right. cards. And, yeah. you know, it's also just like horrendously ambiguous, the actual text on the card. So again, 1994, internet's brand new. Nobody really knows what the heck's going on. This is what the card actually says. It says, when Falling Star lands, Falling Star does three damage to each creature that it touches. Any creature damaged by Falling Star that are not destroyed become tapped. So it, it, that that just sounds like a fight waiting to happen, right? Well, no, it bounced on this one before it landed. Or, <laughs> you know, you can't move your cards around. Like, I cast Falling Star, and now you just have to leave your creatures close to each other, and I may, might be able to get... Wait, three of them or something, right? It's like, you know, th this, these arguments about like, well, do I get to spread out my cards, right? So that you can only try <laughs> to hit one. And yeah, kind of ridiculous. Um, basically, Legends had a, a higher concentration of really powerful cards than most sets. Uh, you know, Arabians can compete with it, even though a lot of those cards weren't really appreciated at the time. Legends. I think part of the reason it was a hit was was that there were these cards that were so obviously good, and then there were cards that weren't good but looked good, you know, the, all the various legends and things like that. And again, going back on the note, the sets that tended to do, I think, the best overall were the really evocative ones because that's so much of what Magic was back then. People didn't really know how to evaluate power level very well, didn't do a very good job of it, and even now – you know, most of the people who play this game don't do it in a really competitive setting. Yeah. So Legends, I think, really lent itself well to that, even if from a power level perspective, you you had a, a pretty like solid double handful of completely busted cards and a lot of really, really bad cards. Yeah, you know, because yeah. they did actually hit the the efficient end of things as well, along with the eight mana six fours and the lands <laughs> that don't do anything. You know, you have Chain Lightning in this set, which is a red sorcery that does three damage to any creature. So it's the closest thing you get to Lightning Bolt. It has some other text that rarely comes up. But, you know, you get that effect. It has Force Spike, right? Blue inter interrupt at the time. So it would be an instant now. Target spell is countered unless this caster spends an additional one mana, right? So these are very efficient. Mana Drain we talked about. The lands, the good lands are amazing, right? We, you, you talked about Tabernacle, which which is a you know, a, a key to some type of archetypes and also the, um, a Caracas, you know, being, you know, greatly overpowered for a land, you know, these are, these are some of the more powerful cards we've seen that still see play in cubes, legacy and vintage, where it's actually hard to find very many cards from like Arabian nights that still see like constructed play. You know, most of those have gone away outside of a few. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, uh so sorry, it, it, Legends has a lot of uniquely powered cards, as in like they, they do things that don't really show up elsewhere, and so I think that's another reason why they feel like they've they've stood the test of time. When you can, you know, when you want an effect and this effect only appears on like one of two cards or one card in Legends, that makes you kind of like remember that set a, li a little better. Now, interestingly, you know, to to zoom us forward to today or this year. Legends has also had some cards banned from it, re retroactively banned for non-gameplay reasons, which, you know, that is part of, of this set's history now, right? That it has some cards that people deem problematic now and that, that Wizards has decided to take out of the rotation. Yeah, we've got uh, Cleanse, Invoke Prejudice, Imprison, and Pradesh Gypsies, I think, are the ones in Legends, those four those four cards. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, some of them, you, like cleanse, for example, uh, you know, two white, white, destroy all black creatures. I, I like. I understand why that ends up uh, that ended up being, you know, kind of cold here. But I, I, I think for the most part, it, it was a relatively set, like normal top down to just think like, oh, you know, because there's hellfire destroys all non black creatures and cleanse. This is destroying all demons. You know, right. that that sort of thing. But then yeah. you look at like Invoke Prejudice and it's like, how did that fly even then? It's not even close to being close. Yeah, Invoke Prejudice is – is it is one of the most unbelievable cards that they actually had printed. Um, it is incredible that this – like like you said, uh, destroying black creatures is part of the uh, the, f the fundamental gameplay, right? Each – each uh, every every color has creatures in it and sometimes they aim – uh, spells at those creatures, but invoke prejudice is like literally racism. The magic card, like 
I think the designers actually tried to say, well, what if we, what would racism look like if it was a magic card? I'm going to read it. It's absolutely absurd that this card made it. And then when we take the step further to actually look at the artwork, it's baffling. It, it actually shows how small this company was that they couldn't catch something like this. But Invoke Prejudice, I don't know why it's blue, but it's blue, 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 blue for an enchantment. And I'm, I'll read the, the Oracle text. It says, whenever an opponent casts a creature spell that doesn't share a color with a creature you control, counter that spell unless that player, player pays X where X is his converted mana cost. So creatures that are different from the ones that you have have to pay double. It, it's literally yep. <laughs> racism. Like it, it is a bizarre design to put into a set for starters. Like I, I it just seems strange to well, think the, like, the, uh, the, you know, the mm-hmm. upside of it is that it's really not a fun design. It's awful. I mean, it's quadruple <laughs> blue and like it never saw play, you know, and all that stuff. So that part was good. But then you layer on that the artist who did this card, there's a lot of uh, like is basically a white supremacist slash Nazi uh, supporter. You can go on this person's website and just there are pictures of Hitler and things like that. So horrible. But beyond that, actually put what looks to be KKK members with axes in the artwork. It, the, the levels that this card pushed the boundaries on for everything else that we see in magic basically from this time frame are absurd. And it is unbelievable to me that any company, even during this time frame and even during the size that the company was when it made it actually let this thing get out. It, it is just an obscenely bad yes. idea to yeah. print this card. Yeah. Terrible. You know? No. Yeah. I, I, I think it's, it's definitely the biggest offender when it comes to that set of bannings that ha- that happened that like, that were kind of like, yeah. you know, on sensitive topics because th- as you say, it, it, it failed on so many levels. I mean, maybe you may, like if it was called something else and didn't have that art, maybe you could make justify that ability or something like that to an early right. card. But like because you had to, like they know what they're doing here. It's yes. not like they have they didn't kind of accidentally fall into this. They they made a card that literally was trying to be racism and then put a racist image on it. Right. <laughs> so not great. It, 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 <laughs> And they probably didn't I, – I would like to extend the benefit of the doubt that they didn't know this at the time, but the artist who drew it was also just a literal Nazi sympathizer. Right. So, it, it, you know, it, it's right. – it didn't work out well. So that one I think uh, – well, uh, not, not in any way sad to see it go. Uh, and, yeah, my, you know, there were some there were some things that were a symptom of the times that I don't think were good, like Pradesh Gypsies, for example. And Gypsies is just not, not – it, it's not a good way to refer to, to that you know, group of people. Right. So uh, that that you know that's something that that got changed. Even though it's important to to kind of tackle this stuff, but I also think, given the the, the climate at the time, I don't know that it w- that I would assume bad faith on the intent of the the artists or designers. Yeah, and I mean, you know, there there's a, of course a huge discussion in the aftermath of Wizards deciding to take this action about if this action is meaningful, if this. Um, you know, accomplishes the goals that they want. And that's not for, for us to decide. That's kind of for the community and wizards to figure out amongst each other. But it is for us to point out the fact that there are four cards from this set that wizards has deemed basically scars on their past enough that they wanted to say, we don't want these to be part of the canon of magic anymore. And you know, that that's something that, you know, when you're talking about legends, you got to mention it. it. It is a thing that happened and it's very real. And wizards decided to take action against it even because they felt so strongly. So it's just part of the story of, of uh, legends. And it, it's a, you know, it's a downside for sure. Yeah, I mean, th- th- there is a lot of loose things. We've talked about a lot of them. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'd like to, one of the last things I'd like to say about the set is like, it also has some kind of weirdly loose things. Um, this set has one of two references to the real world um, via like uh, Albert Einstein. Yeah, you know, so your two favorite cards card there. Yeah. Presence of the Master. <laughs> yes. Presence of the Master has literally a, a photo, uh, sorry, a piece of art of Albert Einstein. And then, uh, Eureka has Eagles MC squared on the um, on the art, so you know they definitely played fast and loose when it came to some of the the rules that they'd set. 
Yes. Do, do um, you think that two, two, two direct references to Albert Einstein is too much in a magic set, or or, or should we be aiming for three or four? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they should do an Albert Einstein planeswalker or something like that, just so you know. Yeah. To codify that he's actually part of the multiverse. The Legends does have what could be my favorite rules text on a card ever. Um, cause it makes me laugh every time. I remember Rashad, uh, showed this to me, uh, when we were, he, he mentioned it as a joke and we, we roomed together, uh, when we were doing GP coverage and we were just hanging out one night and he said something about this card. And I was like, I don't know what that is or whatever. And he showed it to me and I just couldn't believe it. It's called floral spasm <laughs> and it's <laughs> three and a green for a two, two. It says summon spasm, which is just yeah. And then it says, this is the original text. This is so funny. It says, if floral spasm attacks an opponent and is not blocked, then floral spasm may choose to destroy a target artifact under that opponent's control and deal no damage. <laughs> it's so, like, some say there, there, there's players still waiting for floral spasm to decide. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what you feel like today, boy? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like how how did people interpret this when it came out? Where they're like, "Well, how do I know what it decided or not?" Uh, I love it. I, I just think that that is so, such a funny like oversight for the the templating on the card. It is a sentient yeah, it's, magic it's, card. It, it chooses its own path. Uh, I love yeah, it. So oh, overall, I mean. I still am of the opinion that uh, Alpha was the best set ever made, and even in the e like even by grading for the standards in 1993, I would say though Legends gets a pretty high grade for me. I think mm -hmm. that looking at, looking grading it under the standards, I feel it should be graded. I think Le Legends gets an A. There's things it could have done better. Maybe A minus is more appropriate, but it had the sense of wonder, exploration, excitement. Introducing gold was like a really really powerful, important new concept, and Overall, like, Legends did what it needed to do for Magic. What do you think, uh, TBS? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to say it's like a, an A-. minus. Like, one of the things I like about, like, just going over the set uh, right now is how many of the cards that inv invoke some sort of feeling from me. Like, like you know, I, I, I remember opening them, playing them, reading them, trying to figure them out. Um, this is a set that, you know, every card is interesting. Or nearly every card, maybe not all the eight minor crap crawl worms, but it 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 really did kind of like stretch your uh, comprehension of magic. I think I think some of the other sets back then were quite narrowly focused. I would say Antiquities was quite narrowly focused, and so was um, Arabians. But like Legends really expanded the magic universe, and I don't just mean the stories. I just mean what the game could do, what the cards could do. They mm -hmm. just did very interesting things that I think was really, really good for the future. And I think, as you, as you said, Luis, gold, I think, was by far the most important. It, it is just a, a foundational piece of how good magic sets are built right now. And I think that that was really, really important to uncover. Yeah, it feels like this set pushed the boundaries wide open, right? They, they push things in terms of, the way that mana costs were developed in color, but also in amount. I mean, we had eight mana creatures and stuff. This just expanded the view on what they could do by, by pushing these. We're going to do a crack a pack for legends now, but I did have one. I, I may regret asking this, but I actually just don't know the answer. We have in the, <laughs> in the notes, Petra Sphinx banned in France. W what is that? <laughs> oh, yes. I was just pulling out some cards though. So Petra Sphinx is two. White, white, white for a 3-4. It's got giant wings but does not fly, just, just so we're clear. And it says tap. <laughs> Target player names a card then turns over the top card of his or her library. If it matches the named card, it's put into the player's hand. Otherwise, it's put into the graveyard. So basically, sweet. you can tap and choose a player and they guess what their top card is. And if they guess right, they draw the card. Uh, the DCI office in France banned this card because uh, – too many people in France knew what their top card was. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, no. Oh, God. I am not joking. I, I'm not making this up. Those things are both true. Wow. And so that also harkens back to a different uh, age. And this, of course, <laughs> is reflecting more on the competitive scene and how it's grown and developed. And uh, wow. Okay. I <laughs> did not know that's where we we're going, but uh, – 
That is brutal. Uh, okay, so let's do our <laughs> crack a pack for for legends. Let's transform ourselves into the only person who knows what drafting magic cards is in 1994 outside of the original <laughs> playtesters of the game. And we're going to pick a card from this pack and see what we want to take. So we're going to kind of cruise through this, but here we go. Uh, Enchanted Bean is our, is our first card out. It's one white white for a bean. I'm reading the original text, by the way. No oracle here. Any damage dealt by Enchanted Bean during combat uh, to Enchanted Bean by creatures with one or more enchantment cards played on them is reduced to zero. So well, it has power and toughness, so. It's better than it looks. It's a three mana two two. That's uh, w- firmly above the curve. Of <laughs> yeah. Legend. All right. Next is. And this is kind of interesting because one of the things that I always think about when we look at these old sets, guys, is the naming, right? Some of the names are just random and weird. Some of them are a little on the nose. And some of them are like, wow, I bet you they wish they could have that one back because they use some like very like – Light. Yeah, like (laughs) a very – exactly. Like a card that was really evocative – uh, or a name that was really evocative, and then the card just doesn't do anything, right? This yeah, like one you think, is you think the, that they're really regretting naming the card Crookshank Kobolds because they're they really <laughs> want to use that. <laughs> yeah, that, that one I think they're they're okay with sliding by, but this one is the on the nose variety. It's called Remove Enchantments. <laughs> it, what does this one do? <laughs> I don't know. And the text is extremely small, but it says it's white for an instant. It says remove all enchantments you control and remove all enchantment cards played on all permanents you control. If this spell is cast during an opponent's attack, also remove all enchantment cards played on attacking creatures. All enchantments you own are returned to your hand. All other enchantments are destroyed. So – for one white mana, you bounce all your enchantments and destroy all your opponent's enchantments. Yes. It's Wrath of, wrath of Enchantments. Except for they go but to your only, hand. Only, yeah. But only enchantments that are played on permanence, not global enchantments. Right. Anyway, next, Force Spike. Blue, instant to counter target spell, unless his controller pays one. Okay, oh. so so Force Spike is probably the third best card. It's the second best card in the pack when you look at overall magic history where did Force Spike show up? It's been a staple in a lot of really good well, decks. Are you st- are you spoiling what's coming up? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying that Force Spike is not a very good card in Legends Limited because every game goes to turn 20. Okay. But it's very good in like constructed. So I wouldn't take Force Spike here. I would take it beyond, behind Enchanted Being, for example. Yes. But it's funny that it is historically one of the me- best cards in this pack. Just I, I don't know, Luis. I mean, there is a lot of like seven and and six mana creatures. Like, people are going to play That's the Force true. Spike That's true. That's true. Force Spike your nickel bolus, says TBS? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like I that. I mean, I agree that they're slow, but like people t- have to tap out in this set. There's so, there's so many expensive Well, cards. this is – Marshall, bear in mind, this is coming from Ben Runeboggle-Sack over here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Let's get back to that another time. <laughs> uh, Tundra Wolves is next. It's white for a 1-1 first striker. Love it. Yeah, uh, wouldn't I wouldn't mean, hold up now, and I suppose wouldn't here either. Also, Quentin Hoover has some really good art. This yeah. is one of uh, one of his better pieces, I think. Very good. Uh, Devouring Deep is next. This is two and a blue for a summon Devouring Deep. It is it one two, so three mana one two, but it has an ability Island Walk. <laughs> this card is this card is a lot better than you might think. I, I would Is be it? happy to. St- I'd be happy to start this card in my Legends draft deck. Oh, good God! Yeah, that really says a lot. Next is <laughs> Flash Counter. This is one and a blue for an interrupt, which was at the time faster than an instant counter target interrupt or instant spell. Strictly worse than negate, but you know. <laughs> yes, it that's is, true by a lot. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So we're not playing this, though, because I'm assuming that Limited is still about creatures yeah. even in the world of yeah. Legends, right? Okay. Yes. Next is, we did it. Crookshank Kobolds, Luis. You got there. Zero mana, oh, one. It's red. <laughs> yep. Uh, there are no number of these that we would play, right? Like No, you're, you're hard up for creatures. You're not that hard up. Right. Next. <laughs> all right. Here's a heavy hitter. Legitimate heavy hitter. One of the best cards uh, – from Legends is Chain Lightning. Red Sorcery does three damage to any target. And when you cast it, your opponent can pay double red to copy Chain Lightning. And if they do, you can also then pay double red to copy it back. And that goes back and forth until players run out. Very rarely comes up. 
So mainly this is just red sorcery do three to anything. Have Not you ever chained anything? I, I don't think I've ever I, seen I haven't, the, I the haven't like cube. Oh, I haven't I, cube, I've, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, seen, I've seen the chain go back and forth a few times. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, this Easy is pick. this is certainly certainly the card we're, we're we're happiest to see so far. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it, it's an actual spell. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Next is blazing effigy. This is one in a red for a zero three. When placed into the graveyard from play, effigy does three damage to target creature. If an effigy is damaged by another effigy in this manner and is placed in the graveyard that turn, it deals the amount of damage received from the other effigy in addition to its normal three. So that's it's a two-minute cool. 3 3 that nugs for three when it dies. But if you have multiple of these, you, they can all light each other up and you don't lose any damage. <laughs> it's kind of that's kind of cool. But it, but for them, I mean, I actually would play this in a deck though, oh, right? Yeah, you, you'd yeah. be happy playing this because it, it just sits there and blocks their two two forever. And then if they attack with something bigger, it can trade off for a creature. Yeah, but it's worse than chain lightning. It's chain lightning with extra steps. <laughs> right. Uh, Hell swarm is next. It's black for an instant. All creatures get. Minus one, minus zero until end of turn. Color yeah, pie, be damned. Yeah. Also, well, you're going to see a card in, in the dark, which is the same card except minus two, minus zero, oh, uh, marsh gas. But so that was part of Black's right. color pie back then, I guess. But also, well, it's called a hell. Is. It's called yeah, darkness is a fog in Legends too. It, <laughs> it's called Hell Swarm and has this, like a badass looking wasp on it, and it gives all your creatures or all creatures minus one, minus zero. Yeah, it's not a That's, creature. Yeah, this was. Something got mixed up in the card file on this one. Next, by the way, Luis is Blight. <laughs> the card you mentioned before, black, black, enchant land. If the land becomes tap, destroy it at the end of turn. Yeah, I mean, people put this card on your lands to blow it up, but yeah. it's not a very good card, that's for no. sure. Uh, Demonic Torment is next. It's two and a black for an enchant creature. Target creature deals no damage during combat. And creature, it, it literally, the sentence is creature cannot attack. Yeah. So wait, this uh, this is oh, certainly the second best card in the pack because it basically it's removal. It makes it so one of their creatures can't attack, though it is uh, a good blocker. Um, but yeah, it, it's it, it's funny looking at the templating back then. When it says target creature deals no damage, it means the enchanted creature. But right. then they, but then it said creature cannot attack, so it just kind of got lazy in the last sentence there. Right. <laughs> And this is interesting because it makes it into not a good blocker, but a it can still block is what you mean. Right. right? Sorry. It's a blocker. Yeah. It doesn't deal damage. It can still take damage. Right. Yeah. Uh, next is Dwarven Song. They're singing. This is uh, red for an instant. Changes the color of one or more target creatures to red until end of turn. You choose which and how many creatures <laughs> are affected. Cost to tap. Maintain. Or use the special <laughs> ability of target creatures remains entirely unchanged. <laughs> entirely. <laughs> they need I also that. like that it's telling you, you choose which creatures and how many are affected. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this, all this does is make a few creatures red until end of turn. <laughs> Well, it's one of two color changing cards in the pack. We haven't gotten to the last one. <laughs> All right. So our last card, and I don't know the rarity of any of these cards, but maybe the, this the is the last card's the rare. Okay. Yeah. Alcor's Tomb is four mana for an artifact. You can pay two mana and tap it. If you do, change the color of target permanent you control to a color of your choice. Use counters. Cost to cast, tap, maintain. Or use a special ability of card remains <laughs> unchanged. Unchanged. <laughs> not, entirely. Not, not entirely unchanged. <laughs> that's amazing. That is that's, incredible. That's, that's so, so, so a, a little bit of history for this card. This card was the first pack. Like this, this rare was the first rare I opened in Legends. And I was like, you I tried this. so hard to. I opened this card and I tried so hard to, to to make it good. Like I actually had this kind of like red blast Alcor's tomb deck where I'd try and turn everything into blue and then <laughs> it was not worth it. But uh, well, you know, this only, this only changes your stuff, so that that especially doesn't sound like a good plan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, also, uh, also a little bit of trivia: this one was supposed to be Alcor's tome, like a spell book. But I guess that 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 got garbled somewhere, and the and they and they got a they got back tomb art. <laughs> that would make more sense. Like, what is the tomb changing? It just doesn't make sense. By the way, I just looked at the top row of cards that we had. Here's the artists for these cards: 
Sandra Everingham, Susan Van Camp, Christopher Rush, Pete Venters, Anson Maddox, Dan Frazier, and Jesper Mirfors. <laughs> So, yeah, they still had the core, like, alpha magic artists on contract or whatever because, you know, th those artists are, like, all-timers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and we've we've got – you know, th there's a Quentin Hoover in here, et cetera. Anyway. Um, okay. So there's our Cracker Pack. We're taking Chain Lightning, guys, right? Oh, yeah. I yeah. think Demonic Torment's pretty good too, but I would yeah. certainly take Chain Lightning to start. Like if they play a big dragon, Anything. like if this does come down to seven drops, you'd rather have the Torment, right? Yeah. So. There's not a lot of creature removal in this set, I think. I mean, there's yeah, a lot of was, like global stuff. I know? would assume that, yeah. Not a lot of, anyway. Okay, so that leaves us with a little bit of time for the Dark. Now, we're not going to spend the same amount of time because the Dark doesn't have as much no. to offer as Legends, does it, Luis? No, so the, the 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 dark was the kind of the fourth magic expansion. Uh, so that doesn't count, you know, alpha, beta, unlimited, all that. Uh, and it's pretty small. It's uh, 119 cards, and the the theme of the dark I think is a lot less resonant than than some of the other themes like Arabian Nights, Antiquities, Legends. The, kind of the the theme was uh, that everything is kind of dark and more evil. This was uh, after the brothers war, which is like, you know, Urza versus Mishra. And there was like a huge, a huge blast. And it kind of makes that makes that the, the, all the debris was like blotting out the sun. And now all magic is becoming darker. And it kind of explores like, what would it, what would it look like for every color to kind of be more grim or evil? And the, the overall tone of the dark is just not as cool as as or hope as interesting or exploratory as some of these other sets i it, there is a there is a part for uh kind of grim fantasy for sure people do like that but it doesn't quite do it as much for me and i think that 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 sense of exploration is a little less present here the dark overall not the most uh not the most popular set no it, it is kind of tough to sell right because it just magic is something that you want to get excited about. Like what we were talking about with, with legends, right? TBS where like you see a, a card and it makes you want to do something. And the dark didn't deliver on that nearly as much. No, it like, and part of that has to do with the, the power level. The power level of the dark is considerably lower than the sets previous to it. And so when you don't have like, you don't look at a card and say, Oh, this is, this is a good enough payoff for what, for me to build a deck around or for me to put this into my deck, then it kind of has to like, you know, do something else really well. And it doesn't really do the other thing really well either. Like it doesn't have, you know, the resonance of legends. It doesn't have as many gold cards. In fact, it's only got three gold cards. Um, there's just a lot of limited appeal. And overall, I don't think it does anything very interestingly. So yeah. there's not a lot of like cards that are unique. I mean, there are the cards that actually people remember from the dark are pretty cool, but I, I, I think overall there's, there's just not a lot of like kits here. Yeah. What, some, some fan favorites uh, from the dark and, and perhaps more notorious cards. W most expensive card from the dark is blood moon, which you either love or hate. Most people hate it. Um, but you know, still exists. I know one of my favorite cards from back then, uh, I really liked lands was maze of if, you know, it's got this cool Anson Maddox artwork and it's a land that doesn't tap for mana, but you can tap it to basically take a attacking creature out of combat. And that was a cool thing to do. Uh, the dark did give us ball lightning, red, red, red for a six, one trample haste. And that was a huge amount of damage at the time and kind of you had to respect it, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't. Was was Felwar Stone the first mana rock like that that didn't make colorless well, mana? We 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 had the mana batteries back in Legends. These mm. were like the yeah. the four mana artifacts that tapped for a color, and you could like start charging them up. But Felwar Stone was one of the first more heavily played mana rocks, and mm. this is actually the first. This is why they're called mana rocks because it's literally a rock. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, Felwar Stone was really cool. Uh, the Tormod's Crypt, the first printing of that. I mean, that, that that's a card that sees play even today. Yep. Uh, Preacher was a big hit back then. That's a yep. one white, white for a one, one. And you tap it to gain control of one of your opponent's creatures, but they get to choose. 
and then mm. this has to stay tapped. Uh, otherwise, you have to give the creature back. But creature was uh, was a really strong card. Oh, also, yeah. like it's so it's so weird. Like if you look at the the art for preacher, another actually really good Quentin Hoover piece. But this looks like a southern style preacher from like the you know the the from a hundred years ago. It does not look like something I would expect to see in a magic set. Yeah. Like, and this is, this is one of the times, like it's got like the sideburns and everything. Like, yep. like look, he looks like a, you know, one of the preachers you'd see presiding over like a witch trial or something maybe. Yeah. And it just, the, it kind of pulls you out of that immersion, I think. And this is one of the times when the varied flavor or art direction just doesn't really get there for me. Yeah. They, they yeah. made that policy change later, right? Where they said, you know what? We we want to we we don't want to put grizzly bears in our set. We want to put rune claw bears in our set. There we know what right. they we're looking at, but they're a little different, you know, uh, not not earthly things anymore. Where uh, obviously that was a big change, right? I mean, we when we talked about Arabian Nights, you know, they were directly referencing earthly tales there. So that was that was one. Of yeah, those. and and it's part. This is also back when we saw a lot more. Uh, flavor text from like Shakespeare or, or something yep. along those lines. Right. You, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't really see that anymore either. Some funny cards. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, TBS. No, I mean, there, there are some, some also other interesting cards in, in that way, like Frankenstein's monster. That's a, that's a referring to a real, well, not a real world. Is that card religion, in this but, set? There's a card called yeah. Frankenstein's monster. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you see the monster was what Frankenstein created. Frankenstein was the creator of the monster. I see. Yes, Thank Frank- you, Louise. <laughs> <laughs> but no. the, yeah, the, there is still a little bit of a blurry line between kind of like real world, just like, as you said, with preacher, I mean, Frankenstein is a story that exists in our, in our mythology and putting into magic was, you know, something they did with Arabian nights. And you could see a little bit of the remnants of that right now. Um, there's just a lot of kind of – I mean, okay, he, he's a cool card that I feel does define the dark. Leviathan. Leviathan yes. was like – Yes. Just just like a super flavorful and it, it broke some rules at the time, right? It's it's a, it, it's a 10 – sorry. It's cost is blue, 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 five. Okay. It's summon Leviathan. Trample. Leviathan comes into play tapped um, and doesn't untap during your uh, untapped – phase sacrifice two islands during your upkeep upkeep phase to untap it and then leviathan can't attack unless they have uh islands um and it's a 10 10 one of the things is the piece of art is awesome like Mm -hmm. i love this piece of unreal it's just it's so cool um you get a great sense of the size but on top of that it's a 10 10 it was like one of the first creatures i think that was that size if not the first creature yes yeah, Mark Tadeen artwork, amazing. I loved that card back in the day. W- one of the cards that kind of jumps off the page too, because not not because of the card itself, but because of uh, its history, perhaps, is Mana Clash. <laughs> As apparently that was one of the original names for Magic um, before uh, I, they adopted the name quite Magic a bit worse of a name for sure. It's also one of uh, one of the ways to technically win on turn one. It's a uh, red for a sorcery. You and your uh, you and target player each flip a coin. It does one damage to each player who flips tails, and and it stops when both players flip heads. <laughs> so, so you could win the game. Yeah, <laughs> I like well, it. You could lose the game too. You could, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, talking about the naming thing, you know, there's a card called Holy Light, Fire Drake, uh, Flood, Banshee, right? A bunch of like kind of short one word, Electric Eel. You know, just a bunch of kind of evocative names. <laughs> they did make a card called Bone Flute in this in this set. So somebody was was joking around or something. Erosion, right? Like brainwash. Like brainwash, by the way, is white. <laughs> white enchant creature. Target creature may not attack unless its controller pays three in addition to other costs required for that creature to attack. Squires in this set. Just venom. You know, a bunch of 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 one's morale that they kind of just burned. And then one card that I have to point out guys, like if you're making a list of the worst magic cards of all time, this, this is going to make a strong run at that number one spot. Sorrow's path. The land, you guys remember this card? 
Oh, Sorrow's, oh, yeah. Path, Sorrow's Path was known as the worst card in Magic for a long time. Yeah. And I think it's still maybe competitive. It's a land that says, tap, exchange two of opponents blocking creatures. This exchange may not cause an illegal block. Okay, so to use it, you have to attack with multiple creatures. They have to make multiple blocks. And swapping those blocks has to be good for you. And this is on the board, so they're probably not going to walk into it. But that that is not. <laughs> yeah, Sorrow's Path is literally sitting on the battlefield. All right. Yeah. It, you might ask, okay, does this tap for mana? Of course it does not. <laughs> that would be way too good. And it also says... Sorrow's Path deals two damage to you and two damage to each creature you control whenever it is tapped. <laughs> like, it it shocks me, you when, and pyroclasms your board for tapping. <laughs> this would be horrendous without that ability because you just never use it. It's a land that doesn't tap for mana. But this not only makes it so when you use it, it, do, it shocks you and pyroclasms your board. It's also not when you tap it to use it, it's just when it becomes tapped. So if your opponent has a way to tap your lands, they can just keep tapping this so like with an icy manipulator or something. <laughs> yeah. It also has one of the most like confusing and bizarre artworks where it's just like, what is exactly happening here? There's like a bridge in the background with dragons and knights fighting. And then up front, it's a wizard against somebody who looked like they're maybe wearing some chain mail or it's just like, what, what is happening right now? And yeah, th this card I do not recommend playing this card unless unless you like losing your board. <laughs> anyway, just want to before before we we finish up with uh, the dark, I want to talk about like one of my favorite cards I, out of this set is Ball Lightning. I, I don't know if we mentioned it earlier. Yeah, we we did. Did. yeah, yeah but go for yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, th th this card was like defining of like how red decks were were made for like standard for a long time or type two at the time. It's like it's red, red, red for uh, summon ball lightning it trample and it, it has essentially haste and then it, you have to sacrifice it at the uh, end of the turn that you you cast it and it's six one trample and yeah. like at this time there wasn't that much kind of efficient red damage and this was just like such a big chunk of damage um like for a while i, I remember times where people were like wanting to actually like ban this card out of uh, out of type two because it was just too efficient of what it did. Yes. And now you, you look at this card. This card is like laughable. This card, right. you can't make this card. But you know the fact. The fact is, like you know, red, red, red. That's a cool casting cost, and you know, just being just a, a such a concentrated amount of damage is like was was just really cool back then. Oh, I also think it's just a fantastic design because it's a burn spell that's a creature. It's relevant that it's a creature, but it does feel like a burn spell. It feels like this midpoint. It works nicely with combat tricks. They can play against it with removal or with just blocking. First strike's really good against ball lightning. Like, it's a really evocative, well-designed, fun card that it was pretty powerful at the time, but not to the point where it caused huge issues. I, I think that it's one of the few really good designs in Dark, actually. <laughs> Yeah, that card's yeah. super sweet. <laughs> As opposed to something like Goblin Hero, two and a red for a 2-2, two -two, that's not a big deal. But if you look at it, it just doesn't look like a goblin. It's just they drew some random creature that was just not even close to being a goblin. Yeah, that is It not looks a like a, a goat or something. And, you know, <laughs> it's the sort of thing where, yeah, a little bit more tightness would have helped. I think overall, I mean, Dark was one of the first packs I ever opened. Like, my, my first experience with Magic the Gathering was literally opening a, a starter deck of revised and two booster packs of the dark. Mm. But, and so I have a lot of fond memories of these cards, but very quickly, I think I, I learned and a lot of other people did that the dark, yeah, it just kind of sucked. It wasn't, it, it was not spoken of in the same way that Arabian nights or, or, or legends or antiquities were spoken of. And I think that there, there's a reason for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it suffers from, I, I think they started to realize at the time of the dark and, and for the next two sets, like uh, Fallen Empires and Homelands, that they couldn't keep power creeping, or they thought they couldn't keep power creeping in the game. So it represents a, a pretty big shift downwards. Um, and it came at a time of, you know, where the three of the most powerful sets had come out, like uh, 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 Arabians, Antiquities, and Legends. So it was so jarring to go through this time. And it, it was it's, it's actually a testament to Magic as a game that actually kind of, like, 
weathered what I would say <laughs> that it really survived Homelands and Fallen Empires. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, look, it's it, there were really bad sets and had other issues uh, about the, the release just being overprinted and blah blah blah. It's like Magic at, at was was at its most popular, kind of was at a, at a small kind of local maximum at the time, and then it released three terrible sets. And then it still was able to like come back. I mean, Ice Age was a, was a return to form, and and I think a lot of people kind of came into that time, and even more at uh, Mirage and, and and Invasion. We'll get to those later, but yeah, I, I did want to sets, go ahead. Sets, yeah, yeah, no. the sets just mm-hmm. weren't very good, and but but they actually represented something they probably realized. This is my guess that Power Creep couldn't happen forever. We, they couldn't just keep doing more powerful cards. Right, because they ramped it up super hard. I mean, at least in their mind, by by doing legends. But so the dark sort of ushered us into fallen empires, um, and uh, what's it called? Homelands. Homelands. Uh, and homelands. Is that right? Like th- this was it, it? It went the dark, and then those two sets came out after. Yes. yes. So the dark was giving us a little foreshadowing on on that, and. Not in a good way. <laughs> Is that a good way to think of the dark? Yeah, there, there's nothing like the tenth worst card or best. The tenth best card in Legends is much much better than whatever the best card in the dark is. Ball Lightning or Maze of Myth, you know. Uh huh. And and as we transition away from Legends in the Dark here to to kind of wrap the episode, um, are you guys? Do you guys actually want to do uh, your next installment of this series on Homelands and and uh, Fallen Empires or? Uh, I think that we'll Are probably we jump. We'll them? probably jump a little, a little bit more. We'll, we'll see. We'll maybe mention what makes them so poor, but it's kind of not as interesting to talk about because the, those sets, I think, were well, well, they're definitely not the best. Okay. Well, why yeah, don't we? Like, why, why don't we pencil in talk? You know, giving them their spot, but. Yeah, we don't have to go as deep. Well, like we you have to do all that. the sets. Like, come on, yeah. if we're gonna do, if yeah. we're if we're gonna do all the sets, we gotta. Yeah, do all the and sets. by the way, the YouTube algorithm would argue with you about whether it's interesting to talk about bad things or good things. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Fair enough. Um, any any last points that you guys want to put on uh, the legends and the dark and 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 what we came away with from them? Um, uh, just for me, I mean, so, sorry. No, the, this this kind of the dark ended the first like I would say main age of, of, of magic. Like uh, after this, I, I feel there's a significant shift after, after, after the dark. Um, in fact, the dark didn't uh, end up in type two, which was like the first uh, kind of big, uh, you know, more accessible format of, of, of magic. It started off with fallen, fallen empires and revised at the time. So, I think I think it, it, it kind of like it's it's a close to a chapter and 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 it really kind of like defines like before the dark this is early magic this is essentially magic trying to find itself and then after that magic is trying to mature it's trying to understand itself and like evolve into a game that we actually are, are, are much more aware of now um, and so a lot of the things that uh, from a design perspective and from a like artistic perspective, they're a little bit wild. There's not a lot of rules, and what rules there are are kind of like essentially really, really defined by what happened in, in Alpha and 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 less in the other sets. And so I think it's it's kind of important to kind of like understand that the the early sets there. Were, like yes, there was a huge uh, variance in power level, but also they were exploring the game and trying to find out what it was. Mm. And you, Luis, you agree with that? Yeah, it, it does feel like there's maybe a bit of a loss of innocence from, like the, from the dark moving forward, uh, where the dark is kind of more lumped in with the first couple sets in terms of its attitude, where it got played, the, the, kind of what flew. <laughs> or, or in the case of Whippoorwill, what doesn't fly even yeah. though it has a bird. <laughs> uh, it, and I think that you can maybe you can maybe give the dark a little bit more credit if you grade it on that scale. But I just still think it it, it just is poor even in comparison to the other sets. And you know they they get better at, at designing cards as as time goes on. The dark was not the high point, and I think the the, the whole grim mood thing was not. Not really, not, not really something that did it for me. Yeah, so we'll we'll keep an eye on it 
Oops. As we go forward, because the thing that's also interesting is to track alongside these sets with where the company was at at the time, right? Uh, the, uh, you know, you use the term loss of, loss of innocence, and that really resonates because, you know, they didn't know what they had on their hands. And with the dark, you know, I think that the feedback loop will have been fully in place and people, they'll start to see they have a baseline for what sales would look like or what what did well, what didn't, what players liked. There's now content coming out. There's magazines. There's, uh, you know, the beginnings of a web presence. There's information starting to flow about this game. And the company knows, okay, we've got a hit, right? They knew after Alpha, Beta, Unlimited that they've got, and in Revise, that they have like a very real hit on their hands here. And now the incentives change, right? It, it isn't just a thing where you're like, hey, let's just make a cool, fun game. And, you know, let's try... I've always wanted to see what a Leviathan would be like. And uh, here's a cool name for a card. Design it. Okay, it's in the set, right? Now, all of a sudden, you know, you start to see tournaments start to form. You start to see people caring about what the cards are doing and whether they're fun or not. And my assumption is, is that making a set called The Dark, right, which has this kind of bummed out theme to it that isn't really flashy or exciting, but instead a little more flavorful and evocative, but not in a good way probably led them to say, hey, that didn't work super good, you know, and you start to see the slow cycle of them starting to adjust to what's working as the incentives start to get into place. And we'll be able to explore that um, as we move forward through this series and uh, take a look at the the real downside of the early part of Magic, uh, you know, when we talk about Homelands and Fallen Empires. But then, you know, its resurgence as uh, – TBS pointed out as it really starts to find itself with Ice Age and, and going forward from there. So we'll we'll be doing that uh, next time we have TBS on the show. But that is going to do it for this episode of the podcast. First things first, TBS, thank you so much, man, for for coming on the show and doing these with us. We love getting for a chance to late. talk with you <laughs> and staying up late as you're over in Europe, we know. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, also, where can people find you? What have you been up to? Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, I, I've been taking a little bit of a step back i mean i still play like a lot of I, arena i would and, say and that integer. the easiest way to find tbs is to go to uh top us places in barcelona around <laughs> around 7 or 8 8 p.m <laughs> <laughs> look i don't i don't want any stalkers okay <laughs> but if you if you want if you want to you know get me some hamon I, i'm always open to that around here so Fair. no i mean look you, you can generally find me on on, on twitter um I don't really do any streaming right now because I've got uh, a little one who who isn't uh, that conducive to, to, to stream that, that much. But I do actually still uh, keep in uh, contact and play a reasonable amount in Arena and MTGO. So um, you can find me at, at TBS Dash on, uh, on Twitter. Awesome. And TBS, again, thanks so much uh, for coming on the show. We love having you on. Can't wait to have you back on again. Yeah, I, lo- I love to do it. Look forward to it again. Yeah, so. Sure. Uh, yeah, if Louis says it's okay, you know, he, <laughs> we've, um, uh, if you want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. You can find everything related to the podcast at LRcast.com. And don't forget channel fireball. If you need to buy cards, they're the place to go. They're also the place to go. If you need to sell cards, you can sell them one of two different ways. You can go there and look up the card values individually on their website and uh, decide which ones you want to sell, what they're paying, that kind of stuff. Or if it's a big box of cards and you just can't deal with it, you can't be bothered, you can just send it in and you can do you box, we buy, where they'll take a look to your collection or your set of cards that you want to get rid of. And they'll give you a quote for those ones uh, after they receive it and go through them and you can take it or leave it from that point. So two different ways to sell your cards back to Channel Fireball. Make sure you check them out. That is going to do it for this week. We'll see you next time. One of my favorite things about looking at these old sets is it really brings me back to when I first started playing Magic because, look, I have no regrets with where I've gone with Magic. Obviously, I, I'm very happy with the fact that I chose to pursue it as a professional, to make content on this podcast, which we've now been doing for seven years, <laughs> you know, almost kind of insane. But uh, one thing that I have lost that I can never get back is kind of my innocence when it comes to magic. And that's just true of anyone. Like we're, it's good. It would be really hard for any of us on this call to, to go back and 
build a red white deck out of the red and white cards you own and just like go down to the local store and be like, wow, I really want to play someone. This, I, I have this really cool combo, you know, mm-hmm. that's that just they not, don't know about. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's just not how it works anymore. And there was something really charming about the way it worked in the nineties of like, people didn't even know what all the cards in the set were. They didn't know what rares were. You'd go to one card store and people would love a specific card and then you'd go to a different store and people would think the card is bad and it would just be worth 20 bucks in one place and $5 in the other or people and you know people would be playing it and trading it and or or just disregarding it and there was just this really cool wild west atmosphere that it's funny anyone who's listening to me talk about this now is probably beyond it to some degree once you once you're, you're out there seeking out a podcast about magic the gathering but if I could tell the people who who are there to just hold on to that as long as possible, I really would because yeah. there's something that you just can't go back. Some you know some some thresholds you just can't uncross. And I'm not. It's not to say that I don't enjoy casual magic, but it's it's just such a just looking at all these cards. Part of the reason that me and TBS love doing this so much is we, we it just brings back all these memories. And the sa- same is true for you, Marshall. Like it's just yeah. you 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 remember Craw Giant. I remember Craw Giant. You remember putting. Lure on Craw Giant. We both had that experience twenty years ago. Totally. And I mean, to be to be to be perfectly honest, like if we, you know, were all in the same room, we'd be having beers, basically talking about this stuff anyway. So that's that's how this came about. (laughs) You know, yeah, it's like we were just talking about alpha cards one day, and it's just like, hey, why don't we do this on the podcast? Because I don't know, there's just something so fun and charming about it. It's one of the the cool things about discovering new games and new things to play, and just kind of remembering that mindset and i don't know you you, you miss it once you're gone but i will i also wouldn't trade my the experiences i've had with magic for anything no it, it is you know the thing you can get now is you get just a little glimpses of it like during a pre-release or when the set first come yeah, out yeah. and nobody knows any of the cards yet and people are getting excited on social media about it it's um, that vibe yeah. but times a thousand and everybody <laughs> well, the, well the, one of the interesting things just just an aside like magic came up with when the internet was really young and so information wasn't like perfect. And so you'd, you'd get these snippets um, about magic on, on the internet, but you wouldn't have the whole picture. And so there was still a, a sense of discovery, but I think now with the internet's like the information is a little bit too easy to obtain. And so you don't have that sense of mystery for very long, if ever, sometimes, I mean, like a yeah. set, I mean, I, I've already played the set before I even touched the card now. And that's that's a weird feeling, and it's like it's almost like I wish I could kind of like wipe my mind, similar to what you're saying, Louis. Just have that sense of ex- exploration and and something new every time I go to the store. And it's I, I just don't have that anymore. And you know I, I I love magic now, but I also loved magic a lot then, and had really kind of like wide eyes. And I just hope that uh, we can kind of give you a little bit of that feeling when talking about it on the podcast today. <laughs>